we've all got to recognise that humanity is part of the problem of the failing landscape and climate. And we have to start recognising the simplicity of why it managed itself. And fortunately, this continent can show us all of those things. We know simply that plants made this planet capable of supporting the conditions that we enjoy. And as soon as we upset the plants, we start getting disease and all these other things. We've got this silly idea that we don't want plants because we're moving. But the more we move and the more impact we have, the more plants we've got to move to compensate for that, which is how the planet used to work. You just grow a plant and it solves every problem we want. It grows our food, it grows, runs the water, it does everything. And the more plants you have, the more efficiently it works. The ignorance of us, I mean, we just keep doing the same thing through every civilization, when I say the same thing, we destroy the plants, we gradually move from the low ground, which has become sullenized or whatever, to the higher ground, to the higher ground, we trigger er erosion, and then the, ultimately this society collapses. It doesn't matter what humanity's doing, if we don't fix the environment, we're dead. How could we live in a country for so long and be so ignorant about how it used to work? When I was quite young, three and a half, the landscape turned into a desert in three hours. This landscape had a backup system. We take them out and inevitably, this is my fear, it will escalate to the point where it fails, you know. And I saw a little model, it triggered something in saying, we mustn't let this happen again because, you know, we had 3,000 sheep, they got buried alive, most of them. And I knew at a very young age that we had to see that that didn't happen. So I've been watching this landscape carefully to the point where I know that we could prevent it. My mother was a school teacher, so I did correspondence school until I was in uh, high school. Then I did go off to college for five years, but my father had a heart attack, so I left school just before I was 16 to run the station. And uh, so I've had a the school of hard knocks more than anything else. I came into here after being in the dry country, then in an estuary near Adelaide, and then into a catchment. And it made me aware that there was an amazing opportunity in the Australian landscape to learn because it had recovered from all of the processes that humanity has subjected to most parts of the world. By 1900, there was the biggest herd of shorthorn cattle in the valley. In 1910, there were 38 dairies and a cheese factory. Then in 1915, Herbert Thompson started the horse stud. What you realise when these major changes happen so quickly that this is a very dynamic piece of land. And what it did, since Europeans have come to this country, was produce a blueprint of the damage we could cause and a solution that the environment can affect. Because everyone would leave, you know, it was a bit of an isolated area. And in a few years, it would fix itself. Then that day will come back again and wreck it again. You can't believe this stuff. And as we go into history, we look around the world, we find that whole societies have been doing the same thing. And I started to put real effort into seeing what the processes were, could we use them all in any form of agriculture? And you know it can. So where's the damn problem? These seems like complex issues, but when you understand that we can take advantage of them and use them very productively, because the way the old Australian landscape worked, when it got really wet, the salt would be moved with the high water mark. Because the erosions happen and the water's moving in a different pattern, the salt stays there and the fresh water runs away, whereas it used to be the opposite. The salt would go with the fresh water in the beginning and then the fresh water would stay to maintain the system. And of course, I realised very early that that was a massive change because South Australia was so short of water and our water was all going salty. And that's really why I left. And then I came here, oh, these are pattern that shows how to reverse all that. And I thought that would be simple and everyone had listened, but hasn't happened up to now. 
We came here and they'd lost 38 foals out of 45, 18 months before I bought the place. It was what they called horse sick. And they'd shifted the water and they'd created the salinity problem. The billabong was a hatchery in our native fish system. The native fish move up to the billabongs in the flood and then the, they leave the billabong before the water breaks the connection between the billabong and the river. And then, so the big fish go out and the little fish get a chance to grow up without getting predated on. We've got these wonderful things in Australian landscape of how automatically the sustainability was established. And by looking at it and then saying, well, we can reproduce all that. And the productivity is massive and the potential is just unlimited. It's powered by the sun, everything. And if you've got the longest hours of sunlight in the world and you can manage water permanent like this landscape used to, you can't beat it. It's just the best option you've got. It has to be. You've got these highly educated individuals in air-conditioned rooms that never get out here to understand. You know, they don't look at the sky, they don't look at the water or the way the functions usually work. And we've been disconnected from common sense of landscape and environmental climate functions. And we talk about a lot of rubbish, mostly. We are suffering from analysis paralysis. We know so damn much, and we think about so many complicated processes that the simple bits that we could use every day, we don't even know. I had a very experienced vet taught me in South Australia how horses, and thoroughbred horses particularly, have a sensitive and a high tuned in system so that they change very quickly if the environment is not nicely balanced. I would never have learnt what I've learnt if I hadn't had the horses to tell me every time the past is changed it showed up in their system and body and so I was able to get to the highest level in terms of you know we've produced the fastest horse, the toughest and soundest horse all in the first three years. So I knew that the evidence was available for us to do this stuff. And that's what the horses did. The issue with global warming is the energy from the sun is not being used by water that's then powered by plants. So it's a simple message, you know, and while we don't do that, um, the energy is doing something else, like melting the ice, rocking the seas, turning the windmills. It should be a simple physical understanding to people. If you can evaporate trillions of uh, tons of water every day and then condense it every night, you've done this huge energy conversion, which is not going to melt ice, it's not going to do other damage somewhere or create big storms. If you just slow down and spread water, it's the most necessary component, but also the most destructive. So if you run water over land without the right balance of plants and fertility, you actually destroy it. So I want that caution to the fact that that's important. What this landscape offers is a series of processes that have stepped through every phase, fire, floods and drought, desertification back to, you know, a megafauna. Wow, that's just not available anywhere else on the planet that I know of. We have an opportunity, a landscape that functioned automatically, powered by sunlight and gravity. So if we could un unravel how it did it, everyone will benefit, including parts of the world as well. Not even our own government has looked at something that is so basic to our survival. And I think that's just ridiculous. There's people read my book right around the world and it's common sense. It's not telling you something that they can't all do. And there are a lot of people doing it. Unfortunately, the fine tuning of it is what's missing. You can't write it in a document. You can't write it in an article. And so the people right around the world need to scream and say, we need that extra information. And that's what's sitting here. And if you put a coal pit in the middle, the water will drain, the processes will all reverse. On an emotional level, how do you feel about the fact that, in theory, you know, coal miners are arriving here tomorrow? Mate, I could never describe that. 
It's the ultimate in human stupidity. And you know, there's a failure of the duty of care for almost everybody in authority because they haven't been here. No one has said, why do you think this is important? Show us the reasons why this is able to be used by everybody. Never happened. When Joanne was writing a story recently for the paper, she was talking with Stuart, and she was asking about Rain Lover. And she said, what kind of horse was Rain Lover? And Stuart said, it was a cranky old bastard just like my old man. <laughs> so here's to the cranky old bastards. Here's to the people who stick out there who make it happen. Peter, Stuart, congratulations for everything. Thank you.